remain faithful. Imagine if God would give us a word where we would not lose heart, but we would actually gain good courage. Even in these hectic days, that we would not be disheartened, but we would be encouraged. I believe that's what God has for us in his word today. The evangelist D.L. Moody once said this, and I love this quote, Soon you will read in the newspaper that I am dead. Don't believe it for a moment. I will be more alive than ever before. Don't you love that? It's not that he was saying he would never die. He just knew because he was a follower of Jesus Christ, he would never stay dead. That he would be more alive after death than before death. And that's not wishful thinking. That's actually a biblical confidence. It's a conviction-based, courage-building confidence that is not unfounded but rather it's well-grounded in God's Word. And you see, for D.L. Moody, his biblically informed confidence, it, it changed how he lived. It changed how he spoke. And it also changed how he died. Long after the big crowds were gone and D.L. Moody was on his deathbed, he said this, Earth recedes, heaven opens before me, If this is death, it is sweet. He knew, though death is certainly a moment of loss, that death is a moment of much greater gain. For for Moody, to live was Christ, and to die was gain. And he actually talked that way because he was a follower of Jesus. Remember how Jesus talked? When he stood at the grave of one of his best friends, looking at the grieving faces of, of Lazarus's two sisters, what did he say? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Christian, one day you will die, except Jesus comes back. One day you will die, but when that happens, you will not really be dead. Rather, you will be really, really alive. And I want you to see that, not from my word, but from God's word. So will you stand in reverence of the author of the word we are about to read? God wrote this through the pen of the Apostle Paul. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. This is what we read. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed. So this tent he's talking about is the temporary dwelling place of our bodies. And if our bodies are destroyed, that is, if we die, then we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. So we go from a temporary tent to a permanent residence that's not handmade, but God made. And it's eternal in the heavens. For now, in this tent, We groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we currently groan. We're currently burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. What is this very thing? It's dying in such a way that life wins. And the person who prepared us for that is God himself, the God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, consequently, we are always, even now, of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord in some sense because right now we're walking by faith. We're not walking by sight. We don't see him face to face. That, that point in our relationship has not yet come, so, but we do walk by faith. Verse 8, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from this groan-inducing body and be at home with our awe-inspiring Lord. So, 
whether we are at home or away, dead or alive, we make it our singular aim, our life-defining aim to please him. Why? For we must all appear, even Christians, Christians, this is a judgment of Christians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And I believe God has two good goals for us in this passage. And they are that we would do good works in this body. That's the first, or that's the last two verses. And those good works would be based on a good courage that he has built for us in this life. So two goals, good works, based on good courage. Living out good faith. Let's pursue that together. You may be seated. Verse 1, he starts with three words that I think are really, really key. For we know, that is, we are confident, we are assured that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, so he's talking about our body dying, then we have a building from God. We have a house, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. For now, in this tent, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And he starts with, for we know, because he wants us as Christians to live in the know about two things, this life and the life to come. Life right now, current condition, and then our future residence, and let that impact how we live life right now. And he wants us to be in the know because humans tend to fear the unknown, especially when it comes to the afterlife. So that's why Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers. We don't want you to live out of the know. We want you to be in the insider group like we're telling you. Everybody come, get the inside scoop. What's going to happen with those that fall asleep? That is, have passed away, are dead. Because we don't want you who are left to grieve as other people who do not have hope. Because Christian grieve, Christians grieve, but not like other people. We grieve when other Christians die because they're no longer with us, but we grieve with hope. Why? Because they're with him. We grieve in a way that's infused and even enthused by hope. And you know what? I have seen it time and time again, many times in this very room where there's a service, a memorial service. Many people call them celebration of life services because they want to celebrate a life well lived of maybe a mother or grandmother or whatever family member has passed away and celebrate the life currently lived, eternally lived in the presence of the Lord. So we come and we have a memorial service, a celebration of life service, and to see some families where not only did the one who has passed away have a strong faith, but all the kids and the grandkids or the cousins and the nieces, they have a similar faith, so they are confidently assured. They have a good courage, not a wishful thinking, but a good courage that for the person who is no longer at home in the body, that they are now at home in the Lord. So I want to take these moments to orient ourselves to how Paul uses the language of housing to help Christians re-envision their death day is actually a moving day, not a day that's to be avoided at all cost, but to be embraced in God's timing as the ultimate upgrade to a home far beyond their wildest dreams. If you look at verse 1, you'll see Paul says that in the body, and the body that we now have is best described as a tent. You can answer this one out loud. Uh, what was the Apostle Paul's day job? He was a tent maker, and I can guarantee you because tents are tents, he was a tent repairer. So he knew well the attributes of tents. They're temporary. They're mobile. Mobile. They're good for a purpose. They're good for a time, but they're not good for permanent housing. 
And you know what? When he described our body as a tent, he wanted us to know that we were made for something better, more permanent, more substantial than our fallen, failing bodies. As a professional tent maker, Paul knew that tents get tattered, but tents can be patched up at least for a little while. With this tent, we call it medicine. But we also need to be prepared that there's a point where the tent can't be repaired. The tent really is going to show forth its temporary nature. Because tents, they all have life expectancies. But that's only a tragedy if you don't have a better house waiting as your future residency. So I want to teach you a Greek word here. Here, we're going to go to seminary just for a second. It's the Greek word for home, and it's pronounced oikia. Say oikia. Oikia. Look at that. I paid way too much for seminary. You did that really well. Yeah, oikia, and that means what? Home. It does mean home. Now, does the Greek word oikia remind you of anything that you would hear, say, in the Twin Cities or... Sweden, that has to do with home goods. Ikea. Ikea sounds like oikia. So I want to tell you why our current oikia, which means what? Home, reminds me of Ikea. You see, my family and I moved to the Twin Cities some 10 years ago so I could become a full-time student at Bethlehem College and Seminary. And believe it or not, being a full-time student doesn't pay very well. It really doesn't. But my three kids that I already had at the time, they wanted to continue the previously established habit of eating well. There was a tension there. There's a real tension, but that's where Sharon, my Proverbs 31 wife, her genius and super heroics really came to light. And, and there was a time where she came and said that she found out about this store nearby called Ikea. And Ikea changed our life <laughs> in three ways. And I'll tell you, and I'm giving you this in order of importance. Ikea, one, had free child care. Yes. Two, it had inexpensive Swedish meatballs with, with kids' meal free on Tuesdays. And I found out later, they have cost-effective furniture too. If you keep on walking through there, you can find that. So depending on what you're looking for, at Ikea, you can actually find some pretty nice stuff for pretty cheap. Now, you do have to go in knowing that Ikea stuff is not going to last forever. And it may take forever for you to actually try to assemble it with those instructions, but it's not going to last forever. But if you come to the table, literally, with the right expectations and purpose, I think Ikea furniture can serve you really well. And I think in that way, Ikea is like your oikia, which means what? Your home, your temporary home, your body that's housing you right now, it's a temporary solution that can serve its purpose well. And one purpose is storage. You see, when I was a student, I studied much and slept little. So what we did is we took our smallest bedroom down in the basement of our house and we turned it into a study for me. And I would like to give you what I will call the three-second tour. Here we go. This is my study. You see that we went with the uh, Oikea decor. Uh, yes, yes, a few bookshelves right there. And let me show you the other wall. Yeah. As they say, I was booking it through seminary the whole way through. Uh, so, but you know what? These Ikea bookshelves, I love that I have them, but I wouldn't say that I love the shelves because I, I use the Ikea bookshelves to a greater end. And even you must think, oh, Jeremy, you must really love books. Actually, I grew up hating reading. I hated books. I'm still not amazingly good at it. But you know what I found out? Though I don't still love books, I love if I open books, God can open my eyes to know him better. 
And if I read the right books, my heart starts loving him more, and that's the greatest commandment. And I started consuming and reading books that would help me raise my kids and, and love my wife, and I was loving that. So all the Ikea stuff I kept for a greater purpose. All these Ikea shelves were temporary shelving for eternal purposes, just like your oikia, your earthly home. Is meant to be temporary housing that you don't try to keep all the shelves and all the books from burning up. That's going to all burn up. I didn't try to build a library. I just know that Jesus is building his church and I wanted to join with him in that. So that's why we see our body as temporary housing that we're not trying to hold on to. We just want to serve eternal purposes and live in our tent with intention. Because we're followers of Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did, right? Many of us church people, we know John 1.14. And the Word, that's a name for Jesus, became flesh. He took on an oikia, temporary housing, and he dwelt among us. And that Greek word for dwelt, that verb, is actually a verb form of the word tabernacle. What was the tabernacle? It was a tent. It was a temporary thing used by the Hebrews in the wilderness by, at God's command. Say, I want you to have a tent, not because I want you to love a tent, but I will actually meet you in that tent. And then when Jesus came, he said, I'm going to set up camp among you in the first century. I'm going to set up camp Camp, I'm going to set up a tent. It's going to be temporary. But in that tent, you're going to see glory. And in that tent, which will not be glorious, you will see the glory as of the only Son of the Father. And that tent, because I am in that tent, will be full of grace and truth. And you know what? What is true of Christ should become true of Christians in this temporary body. Because Paul went on to say, what? Do you not know? Are you not living in the know that your body, your temporary body, is a temple, it's a tabernacle, it's even a tent that the Holy Spirit himself, full of glory, is dwelling in. That, that Holy Spirit is in you. That is a gift from God himself. That's what your life is. You are not your own. Don't act like you are. For you were bought with the price because Jesus paid it all. So here's what you should do. You should glorify God in your body because your body's going to waste away. That's a given. So make a big deal about the God who is everlasting in your fallen and failing body. That's when Christians are actually following Christ. But Paul was keeping it real. He knew that these bodies, is this true for you? They're very not eternal. They're very not in eternal. And the older you get, I think the more you feel that. I think some of you would say, yes, pastor, that is true. But you wouldn't raise your hand because you're afraid you're going to pull something. And if you feel like that, you feel like that, that's what verse 2 is actually about. That's where Paul's going. For in this tent we groan. Because this isn't our home. We weren't made for a fallen body. We were made for an immortal body, that one day a resurrected body that we're going to get. It could be the Eden body. It can be the new heavens and earth body. But this thing, uh-uh, this isn't the highlight of my existence. Sorry. For in this tent, we groan, longing to put on something different, a heavenly dwelling. So if you've ever felt the wear and tear and the lack of eternal functionality of your body, don't grumble about it, but Paul says you can groan. Oh, man, it's this sigh idea. Man, th this is getting worse and worse, but one day it's going to get better and better. And this groaning is all throughout uh, creation. Romans 8 says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together. Look, it's a choir has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth, saying there's something good going to come out of this, right? But this stinks. 
right now, until now. And it's not only the creation, but we ourselves. Can I encourage you? Not only all of creation, like natural disasters grown, but Christians who are really following Jesus to the very end, they groan because the temporary nature of their tent comes out. Grumbling is a sin. Groaning is a reality. And doing it with joy and not with complaint is God glorifying. So it's not only the creation, but also Christians who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We don't have the totality of all He's going to give us, but we do have the first fruits of the Spirit. Right now, we're groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. What are we waiting for? An upgrade, the redemption of our bodies. In God's good plan, our pain-filled groaning produces a faith-filled longing. And it's a longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found, as we would say in Georgia, naked. Because it ain't, be, it ain't no good to be found naked. That's embarrassing. That's not a good look for any of us. Nobody's wanting to see all that. And I truly believe that's the way Paul would have ministered this good word if he happened to serve in southern Judea. But I don't know if that's what he talked like. But I'm pretty sure that's, that's the point. Paul actually wants people that are in Christ, that are Christians, to realize that the afterlife will not be some kind of nightmare scenario where we're put to shame, where we regret following Jesus, where we show up saying, I've got nothing to wear, I'm unclothed, I'm inadequate, I'm scared to death of the Father now that I'm in the Father's house. Whatever the physicality of it is or whatever it will look like when we are at home in the presence of the Lord, I believe when we appear before the Lord, we will be further clothed, remember that phrase, we'll be further clothed in his robes of righteousness. And, and you could imagine Jesus Christ himself walking over to his own clo closet and handing us garments of salvation. And we put on these garments of praise and we realize that we who have no right to be there are actually wearing royal robes that we can never purchase, we could never afford. And we, when we get to heaven, will not be self-conscious, we will be God-conscious and we will show up to that party with a Christ-centered confidence that we are properly dressed. And in that moment, we will love it and we will be loved by our Father, which you know by faith now. But then you will know face to face. You will know the love of the Father because you will see the smile of his reality. That moment is what verse 4 is all about. For right now in these moments, these stinking moments, we're still in this tent and we groan. We're still burdened. Not that we would be unclothed. That's something less in our current situation. But that we would be further clothed. That's what's going to happen in the afterlife. We're going to be further clothed. And that's why we're singing the song we're going to sing at the end of this service. Because we're going to be further clothed by God himself who prepares us for this. So that what is mortal, that is this body that is failing and is eventually going to be finished. It's coming to an end. What is mortal may be swallowed up. This will shock you. Not by death, but by life. Christian, do you know this? And this can be paradigm shifting for some of us that say, I'm afraid of dying. Even as a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty afraid of death. In that moment when you die, this mortal body will not be swallowed up by death. Death has lost its victory. When you die, this mortal body will be swallowed up by life. Or God's word is imperfect. But this is perfect to give us good courage if we realize that death is actually a toothless enemy, right? Death, sin, and death were the two biggest weapons that the devil had. He used sin all the way from the wilderness temptation all the way through Jesus' life. That didn't work, so he pulled out his greatest weapon. He had death. He killed Jesus. 
the devil thought, I've finally done it. Until he heard the word speak, it is finished. And he used death to bring life, not only to himself, but to all of us who will follow him. So there have been many memorial services where I have said this, and I believe it to be true, that do not see death as the end. It is the doorway to eternal life like you have never experienced. But the more I read the Bible, I think that's even um, given death too much to. I think death is clearly not the end. It is now the defeated doormat that we as Christians step on with our feet. And then we look at the face of Jesus and say, I am now more alive than ever before. Thank you, death and devil, for trying. You came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I follow the one who came to give life. And that more abundantly. And now, eternally, I'm good to go. See you, death. Amen? Amen. Because, it, get this, I'm, I'm going to add 15 seconds to the sermon here because this isn't in my note. But if you're a Christian, let me give you your history of death and then just read the Bible, see if this is so. Before you were a Christian, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Then you were born again. By the grace of God, you became alive and since you were a follower of Jesus, you died daily. You would, if you're mature, take up your cross. And every day you are still in this body, every day until the day you die, you're dying. And then finally, 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 when we get to the day we die, death will have no more impact on us and we'll do nothing but living and we will never die physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually again. There is nothing better that has ever helped happen to anyone's health than for a Christian to die. I don't know how long you'll be in critical condition. How long I'll be in critical condition before I die. This I know. I'll be in optimal condition forever as soon as I get through that. And Jesus is going to lead me all the way That's why Christians need not be afraid either of death. And many of us, I've heard many Christians, and this is legit, say, I'm not afraid of death, I'm just afraid of dying. That's legitimate. But you know what? I follow a Jesus who his dying days, I am pretty sure however I die, whether it be a bullet, a car accident, old age, or a long, drawn-out, painful disease, pretty sure his dying experience far trumps mine. So if I'm going to follow him and be willing to give my life, I'll let him give me any death he wants to give me. I will trust him. Because it's appointed unto me once to die, so I'm not afraid. Because I follow one who has faced death and dying and said, yeah, enough of that. I'm done with that. It's beautiful. Follow Jesus to the very end. Follow by faith. And can I say one word to our homebound people? Those that are at home, that honestly, because their body, their tent is so wasting away day after day, they're they're trying to be renewed day by day, but you're at home and you're looking forward to go home, but you're not released there yet. Here's what I would say to you as you're groaning now. Maybe it's because of disease. Maybe it's dementia. Maybe it's the disease or dementia of a loved one that you're caring for. Maybe it's the constant decline. Maybe it's the continuous disappointment in this life or with your wasting away body. Here's what I can promise you. In Christ, far better. Don't get bitter. Because no, it's going to get better. Far better is exactly what Paul wants us to think. And when he was sitting, maybe you're not going to end up in a jail, but maybe you'll end up in a hospital or in hospice longer than you ever wanted. May we have the mind of Paul who said, 
I'll stay here as long as it's helpful. Like if you're thinking about taking your life right now, keep on reading after verse 23 because he says the reason you don't die, the reason you don't give up right now is you can still give to other people. You can make sure the family is bigger before you go to the Father. That's why I ended up staying. But he said, let me be real with you. My desire, my preference, if I were God, I'd be gone. That's how good his confidence was. He'd want to depart and to be with Christ because that would be far better. In the moment you die, based on the word of God, your experience will be, I don't know, I can't tell you all about it, I can just tell you, it will be far better. Let me give you an illustration trying to help you feel how far, far better really is. Because when you lose your life, you will not be a loser. So, do this. Let's have some fun with this. Pretend that you're on the classic game show, Let's Make a Deal. And you're excited, not only because you got dressed up, but they actually chose you. You got to participate, and you actually won something. You won a brand new toaster. All right? You like toast, so you're really excited about the toaster, but then things go really crazy because somebody hands a note to the game show host, and he looks at it and says, but wait, I have just been notified that this toaster oven is no longer yours. You have lost that prize, but you are not a loser because look behind door number two and see what you have won, and you look back and you hear him say, you have won a brand new car with a brand new boat parked at your brand new fully furnished house. What do you think? And you're like, this, this, I, I can't believe this. It's a... oh. I kind of wanted some toast. <clears throat> that's not putting things on the scale, right? Light momentary affliction, the eternal weight of glory. You're actually taking the light momentary pleasures and saying that's going to be better than the eternal weight of glory. That's from the three verses before this chapter. You know what? As Christians, we need to realize, sure, in death, you lose contact with some things, but it's nothing more than the equivalent of a toaster oven because this world is full of cr people. And I would say the church is full of Christians that are devastatingly discontent and disappointed in this life because they suffer from what I would now diagnose as chronic toaster oven fixation disorder. That is a state of mind that is very unhealthy. I just made it up, but I think it's, it's prevalent and it's rampant. It's chronic toaster oven fixation disorder, and we're so fixated on what we have in this life and what the little puny prizes of this life, and we think if we lose that, oh no, what if I follow Jesus and I lose the chance to do that? What if I lose my life and I, I lose what I've always loved? That's a big warning sign, right? Right there. But instead of having chronic toaster oven uh, fixation disorder, may we turn, not care about that, but fix our eyes on Jesus and say, I press on for the high prize of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And I press on that realizing that one day I will live with the Father and He will welcome me into his fully furnished house. You know what? In my father's house are many. Some of you grew up like me. The ESV, I love it. But they say, in my father's house are many rooms. What a disappointment. I grew up on the King James that said, in my father's house are many mansions. It doesn't make any sense to say that. You can't fit mansions in a house. Thank you, ESV, for being a little bit more literal, but let's just go with it. They're going to be mansion-sized rooms all over the place in uh, the father's house. But the best thing about the father's house is not going to be the kind of place it is, but it's going to be the person that he is. 
So look at this. Verse number five. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. What do you need to get a house? You need a down payment. What is the Holy Spirit? A guarantee literally means a down payment, a, a, a pledge, a first installment because God himself is preparing us for what he is preparing for us. Right? I go to prepare a place for you, but right now, sanctification, him working in your life, is him preparing you for the place that he is preparing for you. And at this time, i got to share one of my uh, a favorite verse of Judy Ware, who a longtime member of the church just had her memorial service here in this room. But a couple of weeks before that, she said, Pastor Jeremy, just make sure this verse is in my service because I want everyone still there to know this. This is a verse she said, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless fully clothed in righteousness before the presence of his glory with great joy. And I'll tell you this about Judy Ware. She had lived a long time. Her tent was really quite tattered by the end. She had lost so much physically when I visited her about a week before she passed. Some would say she wasn't living. She was just dying. But I'll tell you, I talked to her long enough to know that Judy Ware was more alive than so many people that have so many years and so much help, health. She had a good courage and a great joy and a true confidence. And that's where uh, Paul goes. Verse number six. So because of everything he had written and everything that I said, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are in some sense away from the Lord. Why? Because we don't see him face to face right now. We walk by faith, not by sight. There are some people that say, can you prove God to me? Can you just show me? Can you, can you make it where my eyes can see? And my God is bigger than my eyes can see. God's got to give me new eyes before I will ever see my God face to face. So no, I can't. It's not because of the inadequacy of his existence. It's because of the inadequacy of our eyes. So now we follow a God too big to see by faith. And that gives us hope and good courage. Verse 8 says, yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord And that is the biblical basis for phrases like she's gone home to be with the Lord. You could say she went to heaven. You could totally say that. And you can say this, which just accentuates the best thing about heaven is that she is with the Lord or he is with the Lord. Because when we die, we go see our father, which art. So if you were to say Where is that heavenly home? I'll tell you exactly where it is using biblical language. Look at this. Where do Christians go when they die? I'll read the verse, then you answer it. To depart and to be with Christ is far better. Christian, when you depart from this body, where are you going to be? Try this verse. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you're totally gone from this body, where are you going to be? And when Jesus was in his dying moments ministering to a dying man, the repentant criminal on the cross, what did he say? He said, today you will be where? With me. And he gave it a name, paradise. Paradise, heaven, call it what you will. The best part of it is you will be with Jesus. And the worst part of the reality that is called hell is you'll be apart from Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 says this, those who do not know God as their God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, what's the gospel? It's saying, will you just come to me and believe in me? Those people will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. And just like in this body, it would be a tragedy for you to end up in a place where you are away from all oxygen. You will know that nothing else mattered in the next life. If you end up in a place away from the Lord, you'll be suffocating forever. That's why it's called eternal destruction forever. 
Because the Lord that you may not care about right now, you may have rejected all your life, you may have forgotten about and not thought about all your life, you'll actually be away from him. And he will say, you have pushed me away all your life. Now you will get what you have given me all your life and you will be away from the Lord. And you know what? Oxygen matters to you, not because you believe in it or care about it or even think about it. Same thing with God. You can ignore him all your life. You can claim not to believe in oxygen or the Lord, but in this life you need oxygen and in every life you need the Lord even though you may ignore the reality of either one. May you follow your good shepherd all the way. And you don't have to lose heart. Because you know what? Going to the afterlife is like me going on vacation as an adult. You know why? I like going on vacation many times, so I just went down to Florida. That was fun. It was me and my family. But sometimes I go to vacation with my father. And you know what? Two things happen when I go on vacation with my father. One, he pays for it. Yes. Two, he leads the way. Because my father has a sense of direction and can plan a vacation like I never could. So here's what my vacation looks like when I'm with my dad. He, I just make sure I'm with him. And as long as I'm with him, I'm good to go. And I just sit back, enjoy the ride, and soak in the view. That's why I'm not afraid about death. Because my God's planned the whole thing. He's planned the whole thing. And he's going to walk with me through it. We're out of time, but there are two more verses I want to show you real fast. Here's verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, maybe you came here concerned about how long you would live. Let's be more like Paul and say, I don't care. Whether you're at home or away, that's secondary. Here's primary. We make it our aim to please him. Don't live for self-satisfaction. Life will be disappointing. Don't live for people-pleasing. That's depressing because you never know what they're really thinking. Live for Christ pleasing. It is my earnest expectation and hope, Paul said, that now with full courage, that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. I care about that. Whether by life, yeah, by death, sure, whatever. For me to live is Christ. So even when my health is gone, my freedom is gone, I wrote this from jail. You may be thinking about a jail or, or hospice or a hospital. Whatever is taking your freedom, your job is all-consuming. Well, if it's not your God and Christ is, then you're still alive. And to die is gain. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ because when we go with him, look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This judgment is not a judgment for salvation, but a judgment of saved people. Christians know this, your sins will be forgiven, but your good works will not be forgotten. And this verse says, you will receive, you will be rewarded for what you have done in the body. So your earthly actions will have eternal consequences. So you may think nothing profitable is happening these days. Well, we're walking by faith. But one day, not only will we see clearly what God thought, but we will see the face of Jesus Christ responding to how we made it our aim to please him. Choir. An orchestra get in place. Look at one word on this verse. <clears throat> For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I grew up hearing, and it's true. We as Christians should not be concerned with appearances. We should not live to impress people. But let me say this differently. And if you don't listen, you may miss this. I think every Christian needs to care every moment about their appearance. Not how they think they're doing, not how other people think they're doing, but think about this appearance. Christian, will you live every day in light of this appearance? 
where you will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He will see your good works and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant to those who have been full of good courage and good works. But know this, even if you're a Christian, you're a believer right now, and you're like, my good works haven't nearly met his good salvation. Well, one, make it your aim to please him from here on out and see if you can make that appearance a great appearance. But two, when we appear before him, he's going to love what we're wearing. Because I'm not going to be wearing a suit because I teach in a traditional service. That's not it. That wouldn't impress Jesus. I'm going to be wearing Christ-giving robes of righteousness. These garments of salvation that Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah talked about, that's what I'm going to be wearing. So before the throne, we will be good to go. And we'll be so excited that we will be fully clothed and fully welcomed home. Would you stand? And we're going to close the service right now singing singing the song his robes for mine and this orchestra there's one of my favorite favorite introductions it's big it's fanfarish it's bombastic and it's not for you it's not for me it's not for them it's because the king is in the room I want you to think about not the robes you're wearing now by faith but the robes you'll wear you're gonna see your robes Christ's righteousness. You'll see it. You'll get it. You'll say, I really wasn't a bad guy because my bad was trumped by his good. His blood really did wash away my sins. And we will see, not by faith, but by sight, his robes for mine. Let's honor the king as we sing.
prepared to sing that song. You may be seated.